Um, so what's the premise of this book? What's the thesis or the proposition which Paul is putting forward? I see Scott mouthing. Verse, chapter 1, verse 16, right? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. For who? For all. Who believes? Oh, we're, we're narrowing this right down, right? Um, for in it, verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed. Um, so what we have here, and it's interesting, uh, it's been a while since I've mentioned this, so I'll mention it now. Uh, the congregation at Rome is likely the only congregation that we have written to in the New Testament um, that was not established um, early on by an apostle. So uh, Paul, to this point of his life, we know eventually he goes there in chains, right? Uh, in this point of his life, he's never been there. Um, and it most evidence shows that no apostle um, did go there. So what's interesting about the book of Romans is it's the most extensive uh, counting of the gospel, right? And because that would make sense that, you know, Paul nor anyone else has been able to be there in person. So here it is all in writing. Um, and you'll note it's one of the longer epistles, right? And that's why. Now, it's interesting to me that Paul starts this epistle off in a way that probably has made some of us uncomfortable. Um, I would guess to venture to say that uh, some have been uncomfortable um, with uh, uncomfortable with me saying it. That the premise of the book is uh, justification through faith in the gospel. Um, I had someone question me, I've been questioned numerous times, but if you had to say in one question, in one sentence, how are you saved? Well, I think many would probably go through five steps, right? And just put commas in there. I think what we're seeing in Romans, that that's just not where he went with this at all. And I don't think it's at all, especially this ninth chapter, is really going to get the idea that's not how we're saved. We're saved by faith. We're saved by God. Now, what he has done is shown what that faith looks like. Right? And if we have the faith of Scripture, um, then here's what it's going to look like. Now, it's interesting, all five of those steps I alluded to, which are to hear the gospel right, to believe the gospel, to confess Jesus Christ, to repent of our sins and be immersed or be baptized, all five of those are in this book. Um, but it's really important for us, is this ninth chapter, I think, is really going to draw home, to realize that just doing these things don't, doesn't make me saved. God saves me. And so when I talk to people, when I look at my life, it becomes about getting to know Jesus Christ and submitting my life to Jesus. You see, if I submit my life to Jesus, those five things, and quite honestly, a lot more difficult things, I don't want to say aren't a problem. <laughs> because many of them are a problem for me, are just something, if I'm submitted to Jesus Christ, there's something I'm striving to do, right? So that's why, um, you know, a lot of my, um, a lot of, or most of my invitations at the end are more along that, that line at the end of the lessons. You know, if you haven't submitted your life to Jesus Christ, um, when you look at the gospel plan throughout Scripture, Sometimes people were told to repent. Other times they were told to repent and be baptized. Other times they were told to call on the Lord. Other times they were called to um, confess Jesus. Well, why is that? Because people are in different stages, right? We're all striving to.
to get as close to Jesus as uh, we possibly can. Questions or comments? Um, I think that little background makes chapter 9 easier to, to understand, makes it more meaningful for our lives. Um, Joe on here mentions it's always Joe for friends and family. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. We're in the right group. And uh, uh, Jackie as well says hello from the northern folks and Happy New Year. All right, so there is a conclusion to this preposition that we're saved by or justified by faith in the gospel of Christ that maybe we don't think about a whole lot. Uh, and when we do, it's kind of in different terms. We're forced to face this because every epistle deals with it. Um, but it's maybe something we wouldn't think about. And that is, if we are justified by faith, then what about the Jews? What about the Jews? The conclusion is the Jews who don't have faith are not saved. Wait, 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 wait now. Because when we're talking about faith, we're not talking about any faith. We're talking about, as we saw in the uh, first chapter, faith in what and who? Christ. In what? That's the who. What's the what? The gospel. Absolutely. So if we don't have faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not saved. So that means the Jews had strong faith, not in Jesus Christ. They're not in that group. And then there's this really scary idea, and I think it's ever been as scary for us as it was for them, that even these people we don't think much of are saved by faith in the gospel. And in their context, that meant the Gentiles. Whoa, now hold up here. So that's the conclusion. And Paul is going to reconcile that preposition with this seeming problem. That if the Jews are God's chosen people, how can you say that, make a preposition that says that Jews are lost. I keep saying preposition, Lisa. It's proposition, right? Amanda's not in here. You may have to yell that out for me occasionally. Make a proposition that they, the people of God aren't saved. So Paul's going to deal with that. Questions or comments on that idea as we begin to read? Romans 9, 1 through... Uh, Five. Would someone read this for us? The Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Amen. And so Paul starts off with a very, very important concept. He's getting ready to make some very difficult statements. And he says, before I get started, I want you to know that I love my brethren. I love my, my fellow Jews. And I wish, this is a statement that I don't know how Paul could make, because I trust that when Paul makes it, he means it. I wish that I could be a curse to hell and they be saved. Now that's love. I think there's some concepts there. Uh, one, I think of uh, Lenny Ferrero. Uh, at least I'm sure you remember him, but Dave and I would remember him better because you were probably never in trouble. But Lenny would chew kids out in school, and his, his speeches always started and ended with the similar phrase. And, and I appreciate it as an adult so much that most of my 
my lectures to my children start and end with a very similar phrase. He'd snatch a hold of you, and of course he was a wrestling coach, so when he snapped your shoulders into attention, you were in attention. And he'd say, Mike, you're a good kid, but boy, he'd cut loose. <laughs> and then he'd end with, but you're a good kid, and that's why I expect more out of you than that. And so he is coupling this hard um, criticism inside of sincere love. Now, I think as Christians, this is kind of a side application, as Christians, one of the reasons that we have so much trouble trying to share the gospel is we're heavy on criticism and light, if not non-existent, on love. And we wonder why people don't listen. Paul's life demonstrated his love for those people. He'd given his life to them. Um, and so he has that behind. And, and I think we have to get that love out there as Paul is before some of the more difficult concepts. Love that Paul had for them, knowing what he was doing to them before he come to the knowledge of the truth. He yeah. Was, he was actually persecuting, killing them. Yeah. And now he wants to love and show his love to them, and they don't understand it or probably don't want to understand it. Some of them, absolutely. Yeah. So Paul or Bob is talking about a web root. Web root. Don't go all McAfee on me. Since I'm looking here, good morning, Andy. It's good to have you and Bridget with us as well this morning. Um, so Bob brings up this idea that, you know, Paul persecuted the church. So right here he's exhibiting his love or speaking of his love towards the Jews. But he had the same situation with the, the Christians, right? Absolutely. So um, notice what Paul says about... Um, in verse 4 about the Jews. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. I'm mindful of Ephesians, the second chapter. It talks about us, starting in verse 12, what we were separate and apart from Jesus Christ as Gentiles. But the Jews had all these things. Um. Paul is going to address that. He says, that's absolutely true. To them belong the adoption. Remember um, chapter 8 and verse 17 talks about the adoption of sons uh, that we have. That same chapter talks about calling out to God as Abba Father, or dear Father. That's not our right as Gentiles. That's the Jews' right. Right? Um, the glory, they were to be the glory. And by the way, uh, tonight, as we look at Abraham's adventure, um, we see what Paul is talking about. We've been looking at the Old Testament, or the book of Genesis in particular. In tonight, chapter 12 of Genesis, we get to what Paul is talking about, where this comes from. Um, they were to be the glory of the world. That was their right, not the Gentiles. The covenants of God were given to the Jews, not the Gentiles. The giving of the law was to the Jews, not the Gentiles. The worship, remember to Jesus, at the, John 4, to the woman at the well says, we, speaking of the Jews, know what we worship. You know not even what you worship. And that's the Samaritans that he's talking to. Worship was, at the, was for the Jews, worship of God. Um, I think our attitude changes when we understand that was a privilege given to the Jews. Right? I've told many of you the story about 
uh, at Blairsville just being completely tapped out. I was working 90 hours a week plus speaking, um, speaking, and it just, I got to a point in my life where I was really dying and didn't recognize it yet. And Christian, I get in the vehicle to go to the services because I needed to do the shoveling and salt in the sidewalk and, and all of that. Um, and Amanda's still doing barn work before she'd rush and get ready and, and come down. And I quite honestly was bitter. Bitter. And we're coming up toward Drought 22 in this flock of turkeys come across the road. I was really tempted to just bike the throttle and run a few of them over, just see if it helped my, my frame of mind at all. And I reluctantly hit the, the brake and just now irritated at these turkeys for even slowing me up further. And Christian sitting next to me, he says, Dad, are those turkeys going to church? And a simple question because I then had to explain to him that those turkeys didn't have that privilege. You see, even though there were a lot of extra things dumped on me, or so I felt, and many so, by people not God, right? Even though I was carrying this burden that I didn't think was, was fair, I realized I was getting the tremendous privilege. Kind of log that, if you would, because hopefully that's complimentary to, to the lesson this morning. Um, but it was for the Jews and, of course, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. We're going to talk to Abraham, that first patriarch, right? Uh, he couldn't necessarily say that. He's the beginning. But Noah was a patriarch. Shem was a patriarch. So he's not the first, but he's, he's the first big patriarch, right? That's the point of the Old Testament. God is preserving that seed through his patriarchs. They belong to the Jews, no one else. From their race, according to the flesh, is Christ. Can't take that away from them, right? Paul says all these positive things. And so you would think that he just defeated his own argument before he ever got started. What he has done is he's accepted 90% of the, the other person's argument. You ever notice this in arguments? And this is the nature of arguments, and it's why Dale Carnegie says no argument can ever be won. I hope philosophy is helpful. <laughs> I, I read a lot, so uh, these things for me are helpful. Because in arguments... You never give any ground because that's dangerous. That's different than seeking the truth. And many times we approach finding the truth of God is an argument. And even though someone has a good point on the other side, we don't dare admit to that because that would be giving ground. Jerry, do, do your and Wanda's interactions ever look like that? Sometimes I, I was confident that would be the case because that's the nature, right, of an argument. Now, Paul gives 90% of the ground up here. He says, you're right on all this. And then he's going to start from their perspective. Amazing, um, amazing uh, point of sharing the gospel. Great to have the Moors with us this morning as well. All right, so then verse 6 is the first question. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. So here is Paul's first contention. If all this is true, and that was all by the word of God, and now you're saying God's rejecting them, then obviously the word of God has failed. Remember, he says to Abraham, through you all nations shall be blessed. The Jews have a very specific idea in mind in how that would be accomplished. So obviously, the word, the Jew would say, if Paul, what you're saying is right, the word of God has failed. Because here's what the word of God said. 
You've heard arguments like that over religious issues before, I'm certain. Um, so here's his answer. Um, 6 through 13. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. The means that is not the children of the flesh, that means is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as his offspring. Let me pause here for a second. The point that Paul is going to drive home is we are saved because God wants to save us. I think sometimes we've struggled with enough humility to say that. Well, I did. We're like the rich young roller, right? I've done all that from the time I was a youth. Paul's going to bring out a very different aspect of salvation. So here's his direct argument. Being a son of Abraham isn't what made you God's people. Can anyone tell me, maybe you've read ahead, but before we go... What's a logical and absolutely definitive answer to that? If being a son of Abraham saves you, then what about? Okay, well, I'm saying, uh, what's Paul's argument? He's got an argument from scripture he's about to give. They're saying, I'm a, I'm a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, I'm saved. Okay? But that's not what the Old Testament was focused on. It was about that descendant, right, of Abraham, in Abraham's children. They were punished physically if they were done, did wrong. That's, this is exactly what we're talking about, salvation is of the Jews. Yeah, we've got two. What about Ishmael? Is he not a son of Abraham? Why is Isaac chosen? Why is salvation through Isaac's seed and not Ishmael? They are both sons of Abraham. It's because God chose Isaac. Same thing as we're going to bring out Jacob and Esau, right? Why Jacob and not Esau? It's God's decision. Um, so starting again in, 16, in 6 with that idea in mind, it's not as though the word of God is failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but children of the promise who are counted as offspring. You see that point? It's because God said this is where the promise is. In verse 9, for this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, though they are not yet born and yet done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now that last quote's from Malachi, the first chapter, um, verses 2 and 3. Why was it Jacob that was chosen, and not Esau? Is it because of his righteousness? No. In fact, 
I would say the opposite. Jacob's a great example of this. Jacob seems way more wicked than Esau. It was because of the election that Jacob became righteous. God kept working in his life, kept working in his life, gave him a heavy dose of his own medicine, <laughs> and slowly Jacob turned around, right? Now, I do think this is an important point. Paul's point, and he's going to elaborate on this, is it's because God chose to save you. Not because you've earned it, not because you're of the flesh, and as we're going to see, not because you did any certain things, God has chosen to save you. Now, what we're talking about here in context is not necessarily individual salvation. It has application to that. But where many would go with this is say, well, before I was born, God says, uh, Scott, I'm going to save you. Mike, I hated you before I was ever born. That is simply not the context. We could examine that whole idea, but that's not the context of this chapter. Right? He's talking about how the rejection of the Jews at this point does not mean that God's word has failed. What he is doing is showing the consistency of God's principle throughout time. God did not change, did he? His principle was there, and it remains the same until today. <laughs> You're allowed to scratch. I'm just going to call you out. You do. <laughs> Questions or comments? Should that not be a humbling concept for you and I, though? It is for me. It drives it, and we see this message elsewhere in Scripture, but I'm simply not worthy. God saves me despite me. That's amazing. All right, next question. So the first question is, well, if what you're saying, Paul, is true, then the word of God has failed. Um, the second objection is found in verse 14. Is there injustice in God's part? Now, we're going to use a classic example here. Um, even more stronger than one we just used. So the next question is, what you're saying is true, Paul. Then is God unjust? Like I used to squall to dad as a young child. That's not fair. <laughs> and I hated the response that I now give my children. Life isn't fair. Get used to it. <laughs> right? So now we're going to squall out to God. That's not fair. In other words, God, you are unjust. Think about this concept, or at least it helps me. Hopefully it helps you. Why did Job suffer? The devil thought that he could be turned away by sorrow and grief, and God knew that he was a man of strong faith and belief, and he proved the devil wrong. Absolutely. So Job suffered because of his righteousness, right? All those things Mike says isn't true. What's Job's, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to Job when I say it this way, but to be consistent in my terminology, what's Job's squall to God? <laughs> Most of the book of Job is Job squalling, right? What's he squalling? Unfair, right? That's his point. All right, um, starting in verse 14 of Romans 9. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is Exodus 33 verse 19 where Moses is begging to see God's glory. A subtle point here is that God, uh, the, excuse me, Moses does not um, 
deserve to see God's glory. Can you step out? You're not being punished. You'll see. Um, Moses does not deserve to see God's glory. Right? And before he introduces himself to Moses, he says, I will show mercy on who I will show mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Same point is what we looked at, but now let's take it further. Verse 17 of Romans 9, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that by my name might be proclaimed all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, this point was taken by one of our YouTube commenters. Um, a, a speaker said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And as one of our commentators accurately, uh, although I don't think that the speaker was um, completely errant, he was looking at a different side of the same coin, right? Um, draws this out. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We see that written numerous times in the book of Exodus. Now hold on. How can you punish a man, God, for what you have done to him? The point, God is in control. He's going to save who he wills to save. As we're going to see next, he has that right. So, is there injustice on God's part? Don't miss this point. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Um, children, from the time they're this high until they're squabbling and fighting over inheritance, all have the same squall, right? Well, mom gave you this. Dad gave you that, and I never got a thing, right? You were always Dad's favorite. And, and you know what occurs to me as I say that, especially that way, I probably stepped on 40 toes <laughs> as I hear. I don't have a one intentionally in mind. It just, it's universal. From time they're knee high, you know, it, the accusation's been made. Dad and I had a conversation about inheritance the other day. Dad, no one is owed a, anything. Your children aren't owed anything. Do with as you will. The point being made here is God's mercy. We all fall short. Remember chapter 3? It's God's mercy that remedies that. It's his to do with as he will. Now, we're going to see that he used Pharaoh. How did Pharaoh get so powerful? You know, I think this is an important concept. Mike and I kind of touched on this. We were talking back here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in time, political unrest, and, and we're just seeing what we're seeing in this country's mouth, right? I think probably to the future and, and certainly from the history. This is important for us to remember. How did Pharaoh get to power? How did he become so mighty? God did it. God put him right where he's at. Now hold on, he's persecuting God's people. God put him there to do exactly what he intended him to do. Right? Here's the other side of that point. So then, how is God unjust? for taking away what he first gave. I once let someone borrow a very expensive piece of machinery and they had it for several weeks. And I told them, I said, listen, this is the last weekend you can have it. I need that back. They got mad at me. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> Give it back now, was what my response wanted to be, right? You see the point? We say, well, that's ridiculous. How many times do we do that with God? 
questions or comments? We will look at the third example next week, and, and that is then how does God find fault? If God hardened Pharaoh's heart, how then can he find fault? We'll deal with that next week. But let me leave you with verse 32, the conclusion to the story. Uh, why is he able to reject the Jews and still stay true to his word? Verse 32, because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were based on works. He's not criticizing their works. We'll get into that, Lord willing, next week. Questions as we close. Comments. Thank you for your time.